Section number 33 of the Mary Frances Story Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Mary Frances Story Book by Jane Eyre Fryer. Robert of Sicily. There is an old legend of a proud king named Robert of Sicily. This legend tells of the greatest event of Robert's life, and the poet, Longfellow, has written a beautiful poem about it, which everyone should read. This is the story. Robert, king of Sicily, was a very proud monarch, and a very selfish one. He spent most of his time enjoying himself and gave little heed to the wants of his people. On St. John's Eve, he attended Vesper service with a great retinue of knights and lords and pages. He was dressed most magnificently, and proudly sat while the choir chanted some strange Latin words. The king did not understand Latin, and turned to a learned clerk nearby. He said, What do those words mean? The clerk answered, They mean, He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. The king laughed scornfully, and said, It is well that such words are sung in Latin, for there is no power on earth that can push me from my throne. Then he leaned back, yawning, and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was already night. The church was empty and all in darkness. The king was angry at finding himself alone. He groped his way toward the great doors, but found them locked. He thought of the windows, but they were high above his reach. Then he became frightened and cried aloud. He listened, but all that he heard was the resounding echoes of his cries as they rang again and again through the high vaulted ceiling of the church. He knocked with his fists against the doors, and swore awful oaths against every one in his court. He became so angry that he tore his magnificent robes into shreds. He had long since lost his hat and cloak. At length the sexton of the church heard the noise, and he thought that perhaps thieves were breaking into the church so he lit his lantern and went to the door. When he could make himself heard, he asked, Who is there? The king, half choked with rage, answered fiercely, Open, tis I, the king, are you afraid? The frightened sexton muttered to himself, It is some drunken beggar, or someone crazy, and turning the great key, he flung open the doors. A man in torn garments, without hat or cloak, rushed past him. He neither looked at him nor spoke, but vanished almost like a scepter from his sight. Bareheaded, breathless, covered with dust and cobwebs, Robert strode on through the darkness and came to the palace gates. He rushed through the courtyard, thrusting aside the guards and pages, and hurried up the broad stairs. From hall to hall he passed in breathless speed, although he heard voices and cries to stop him, until he came to the banquet room, which was blazing with light. There he stood motionless, speechless, amazed, for on the throne there sat another king, wearing his crown, his robes, and even his signet ring. He looked at first glance exactly like King Robert. He was of the same height and the same form and features, but there was a gracious beauty about him which Robert lacked. King Robert stood there, gazing at him in anger and rage when he looked up. With a glance of surprise and pity, he asked, Who are you? Robert answered, I am the king, and I have come to take my place. You are an impostor who pretends to be king. At these words, 
the angry guests sprang up with drawn swords but the man of the throne said no not the king but the king's jester you shall from now on wear the bells and scallop cape of the court jester and make fun for us all your companion shall be an ape then he turned away toward his guests some of the servants came forward to take robert away and they were quite deaf to his ravings and angry threats with shouts of laughter they pushed him on before them down the stairs and mockingly bowed before him and pretended to honor him all the while laughing and tittering and making fun of him they left him in a room in the stable where at length exhausted he fell asleep the next morning waking with the first day's light he thought to himself i've had an ugly dream but the straw rustled when he turned his head and there were the jester's cap and bells lying near he heard the horses clapping in their stalls and on looking around the room saw the poor ape so he remembered it was no dream his happy life he thought could not be changed had vanished from him the days came and went under the rule of the new king the island prospered as never before robert continued to be the jester laughed at and scorned his only friend was the ape his only food what others left sometimes the other king would meet him and ask are you still the king and always robert would throw back his head and fling the answer haughtily i am i am the king robert had two brothers one was Valmond, emperor of Albane, the other was Pope Urbane. One day, almost three years after the wild night that Robert had been locked in the church, ambassadors came from Valmond, emperor of Albane, bringing letters. The letters asked King Robert to join his brother Valmond in a visit to their brother at Rome. The ambassadors were received with great pleasure and were presented with many beautiful gifts of robes and jewels then the king who was not king robert went with them across the sea to italy he was accompanied by a great retinue of knights all dressed in uniform wearing gay plumes in their helmets they rode horses with jeweled bridles and even wore golden spurs they were followed by pages and servants and toward the very last robert the jester rode on a piebald pony and behind was perched the ape though every town they went they made much fun for the people who followed along after laughing and poking fun at them the company were received with great pomp and ceremony and the three brothers seemed delighted at being together again suddenly robert burst through the crowd and running up to them cried i am the king do you not know me look at me i am your brother robert of sicily this man is but an impostor he is not the king the emperor and the pope looked at the angry worried jester for a long moment then the emperor laughed and said what strange sport to keep a crazy fellow for a jester and the poor baffled jester was hustled back into the crowd then came easter sunday and the beauty and the solemnity of easter services touched the hearts of all men robert was deeply moved for the first time in life he saw what kind of men he had been he saw how selfish and proud and haughty he had been he wished with all his soul that he had been a better man and he made up his mind that no matter what happened he would never be so selfish and mean again now the visit ended the grand visitors left rome and journeyed homeward and when they were once more established the king on the throne sent for robert he motioned everyone else out of the room and beckoned robert to draw near and when they were alone he asked art thou the king 
Robert bowed his head, and folding his arm, said, You know best. I only know that I have sinned, and have been proud and selfish. Let me go from here and try to make up in some way for the wrong which I have done. And just as he finished saying this, there rose through the windows loud and clear words of the chant. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. Then the man who was with Robert cried joyously, I am not the king, I am an angel, you are the king. When King Robert raised his eyes, lo, he was alone but all dressed in his magnificent apparel as of old, and when his courtiers came, they found him kneeling upon the floor in silent prayer. Robert was fortunate, said the story king, in learning his lesson before it was too late. Yes, indeed he was, answered the story lady. The fourth story is of a young man who repented when it was too late. End of section 33. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 34 of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Mary Frances Storybook by Jane Eyre Fryer The Man Without a Country Once there was a man, a young officer in the United States Army, who did a dreadful thing. He cursed his native country. He pretended for a while that he did not care. When he was punished, but in the end he was very, very sorry. Because he wore his uniform without the official buttons, the sailors on the ships on which he was imprisoned called him Plain Buttons. His name was Philip Nolan. Lieutenant Nolan was as fine a young officer as there was in the Legion of the West, as the Western Division of the United States Army was called in those early days. 100 years ago. At the time, the Mississippi Valley was the far west to most people, and seemed a very distant land indeed. There were a number of forts along the river, and Nolan was stationed in one of these. Nolan's idol was the brilliant and dashing Aaron Burr, who visited the fort several times between 1805 and 1807. He walked and talked with Nolan and obtained a very strong influence over him. He got Nolan to take him out in his skiff and show him something of the great river and the plans for the new post. And by the time Burr's visit was over, Nolan was enlisted body and soul in Burr's disloyal schemes. From then on, though he did not yet know it, Nolan lived as a man without a country. Burr soon got into trouble with the government, and some of his friends were tried for treason, Nolan among them. It became very plain during the trial that Nolan would do anything Burr told him, that he would obey Burr far quicker than his country, in spite of his oath as an officer of the army. So when Colonel Morgan, who was president of the court, asked Nolan, at the close of the trial, whether he wished to say anything to show that he had always been faithful to the United States, he cried out in a fit of frenzy, Curse the United States! I wish I may never hear of the United States again! Probably he did not realize how the words would shock old Colonel Morgan and the other members of the court. Half the officers who sat with him had served through the Revolutionary War, and had risked their lives, not to say their necks, 
cheerfully and loyally for the country which nolan so lightly cursed in his madness it may be said for nolan that he had grown up in the west of those days then an almost unknown country he had been educated on a plantation where the most welcome guests were spanish officers and french merchants from orleans who to say the least were unfriendly to the united states he had spent half his youth with an older brother hunting horses in texas which was not then a part of the united states in a word the united states meant almost nothing to him yet there was little excuse for nolan he had sworn on his faith as a christian to be true to the united states it was the united states which gave him the uniform he wore and the sword by his side nay burr cared nothing for poor nolan but it picked him out to aid him in his wicked plots only because of the uniform he wore of course nolan did not know this and it did not excuse him but it does partly explain why he cursed his country and wished that he might never hear her name again he never did hear her name but once again from the moment september twenty third eighteen o seven till the day he died may eleventh eighteen sixty three he never heard her name again for that half century and more he was a man without a country colonel morgan as you may suppose was terribly shocked if nolan had compared george washington to benedict arnold or had cried god save king george morgan would not have felt worse he called the court into his private room and returned in fifteen minutes with a face white as a sheet to say prisoner hear the sentence of the court the court decides subject to the approval of the president that you never hear the name of the united states again nolan laughed but nobody else laughed the whole room was hushed dead as night for a minute then colonel morgan added mr marshall take the prisoner to orleans in an armed boat and deliver him to the naval commander there request him to order that no one shall mention the united states to the prisoner while he is on board ship colonel morgan himself went to washington and president jefferson approved the sentence so a plan was formed to keep nolan constantly at sea far from his own country the ships of our navy took few long cruises then but one ship was directed to carry the prisoner as far away as it was going then transfer him to another vessel before it sailed for home he was to be confined only so far as necessary to prevent his escape and to make it certain that he never saw or heard of his country again as soon as a vessel on which nolan sailed was homeward bound nolan was transferred to an outward bound vessel for another cruise at first he made light of it but in time he learned something he had not thought of perhaps that there was no going home for him even to a prison there were some twenty such transfers which took him all over the world but which kept him all his life at least some hundred miles from the country he had hoped he might never hear of again nolan wore his uniform but with plain buttons he always had a sentry before his door but the men were as good to him as his sentence permitted no mess wanted to have him with them too steadily because they could never talk about home matters when he was present more than half the talk men liked to have at sea they took turns inviting him to dinner and the captain always asked him on mondays he could have any books or papers not printed in america newspapers having any mention of america had to be gone over and the allusions cut out he used to join the men as they were reading on deck 
and take his turn in reading aloud. Once they were cruising around the Cape of Good Hope, somebody got hold of Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel, which was then new and famous. Nolan was reading to the others when he came to this passage. Breathes there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land, whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned, from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go, mark him well, for him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, boundless his wealth as wish can claim. Despite those titles, power and pelf, the wrench consecrated all in self. Here the poor fellow choked and could not go on, but started up and flung the book into the sea and fled to his stateroom it was two months before he dared join the men again there was a change in nolan after this he never read aloud again unless it was the bible or shakespeare or something else he was sure of he was always shy afterwards and very seldom spoke unless spoken to except to a very few friends he generally had the nervous, tired look of a heart-wounded man. Sometimes he tried to trap people into mentioning his country, but he never succeeded. His sentence was too well known among the men who had him in charge. There was only one day on which, perhaps, he was really happy, except when he knew his lonely life was closing. Once, during the war of 1812, the ship on which he was staying had a fight with an English frigate. A round shot from the enemy entered one of the ports and killed the officer of the gun himself and many of the gun's crew. Now you may say what you choose about courage, but that is not a nice thing to see. But as the men who were not killed picked themselves up, and they and the surgeon's people were carrying off the bodies there appeared nolan in his shirt sleeves with the rammer in his hand and just as if he had been the officer told them off with authority who should go to the cockpit with the wounded men who should stay with him perfectly cheerily and with that way which makes men feel sure all is right and is going to be all right. And he finished loading the gun with his own hands, aimed it, and bade the men fire. And there he stayed, captain of that gun, keeping those fellows in spirits, till the enemy struck, sitting on the carriage while the gun was cooling, though he was exposed all the time showing them easier ways to handle heavy shot, making the raw hands laugh at their own blunders, and when the gun cooled again, getting it loaded and fired twice as often as any other gun on the ship. The Commodore walked forward by way of encouraging the men, and Nolan touched his hat and said, I am showing them how we do this in the artillery, sir. I see you are, and I thank you, sir, the Commodore said, and I shall never forget this day, sir, and you never shall, sir. And after the whole thing was over, and he had the Englishman's sword in the midst of the state and ceremony of the quarter-deck, he said, Where is Mr. Nolan? Ask Mr. Nolan to come here. And where Nolan came, he said, Mr. Nolan, we are all very grateful to you. You are one of us today. You will be named in the dispatches. And then the Commodore took off his own sword of ceremony and gave it to Nolan and made him put it on. Nolan cried like a baby, and well he might. He had not worn a sword since that infernal day at Fort Adams. 
but always afterwards on occasions of ceremony he wore that quaint old french sword of the commodore's the commodore did mention him in the dispatches and asked that he might be pardoned he wrote a special letter to the secretary of war but nothing ever came of it at another time nolan went with a young officer named vaughan to overhaul a dirty little schooner which had slaves on board nolan was the only one who could speak portuguese the language used by the slaves there were but a few of the negroes vaughan had their handcuffs and ankle cuffs knocked off and put these on the rascals of the schooner's crew then nolan told the blacks that they were free and that vaughan would take them to cape palmas now cape palmas was a long way from their native land and they said not palmas take us home take us to our own country take us to our own picnickies and our own women one complained that he had not heard from home for more than six months it was terribly hard for nolan but he translated these speeches and told the negroes vaughan's answer in some fashion tell them yes 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 vaughan said tell them they shall go to the mountains of the moon if they will if i sail the schooner through the great white desert they shall go home and they all fell to kissing nolan and wanted to rub his nose with theirs as they were being rowed back to the ship he lay in the stern sheets and said to a young midshipman of whom he was very fond youngster let that show you what it is to be without a family without a home and without a country and if you are ever tempted to say a word or, or do a thing that shall put a bar between you and your family your home and your country pray god in his mercy to take you at that instant home to his own heaven stick by your family boy forget that you have a self while you do everything for them think of your home boy write and send and talk about it let it be nearer and nearer to your thought the farther you have to travel from it and rush back to it when you are free as that poor black slave is doing now and for your country boy and the words rattled in his throat and for that flag and he pointed to the ship never dream a dream but of serving her as she blinds you through the service you carry through a thousand hells no matter what happens to you no matter who flatters you or abuses you never look at another flag never let a night pass but you pray god to bless that flag remember boy that behind all these men you have to do with behind officers and government and people even there is the country herself your country and that you belong to here as you belong to your own mother stand by her boy as you would stand by your mother if those devils there had got hold of her to-day and then nolan added almost in a whisper oh if anybody had said so to me when i was of your age years passed on and nolan's sentence was unrevoked though his friends had more than once asked for a pardon the end came when he had been upwards of fifty years at sea and he asked the ship's doctor for a visit from captain danforth whom he liked danforth tells us about nolan's last hours and calls him dear old nolan so we know his love was returned the officer saw what a little shrine poor nolan had made of his stateroom up above were the stars and stripes and round a portrait of washington he had painted a majestic eagle with lightnings blazing from his beak and his foot just clasping the whole globe 
which the wings overshadowed nolan said with a sad smile here you see i have a country over the foot of the bed was a great map of the united states drawn from memory which he had there to look upon as he lay in his berth quaint old names were on it in large letters indiana territory mississippi territory and louisiana territory danforth he said i know i am dying i cannot get home surely you will tell me something now stop stop do not speak till i say what i am sure you know that there is not in this ship that there is not in america god bless her a more loyal man than i there cannot be a man who loves the old flag or prays for it as i do there are thirty-four stars in it now danforth i thank god for that though i do not know what their names are there has never been one taken away i thank god for that but tell me something tell me everything danforth before i die captain danforth in writing about it afterwards says i felt like a monster that i had not told him everything before though obeying orders who was i that i should have been acting the tyrant all this time over this dear sainted old man who had expiated in his whole manhood's life the madness of a boy's treason mr nolan he said i will tell you everything you ask about then he told him the names of all the new states and drew them on the map he told him of the inventions the steamboats the railroads and telegraphs he tried to tell him all that had happened to the great and growing country in fifty years he told him about abraham lincoln who was then president except that he could not wound his friend by mentioning a word about the cruel civil war which was then raging nolan drank it in and enjoyed it more than we can tell after that he seemed to grow weary and said he would go to sleep he bent danforth down and kissed him and said look in my bible captain when i am gone danforth went away with no thought that this was the end but in an hour when the doctor went in gently he found nolan had breathed away his life with a smile they looked in his bible and there was a slip of paper at the place where he had marked the text they desire a country even a heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he hath prepared for them a city on this slip of paper he had written bury me in the sea it has been my home and i love it but will not some one set up a stone for my memory at fort adams or at orleans that my disgrace may not be more than i ought to bear say on it in memory of philip nolan lieutenant in the army of the united states he loved his country as no other man has loved her but no man deserved less at her hands end of section thirty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number thirty five of the mary francis storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the mary francis storybook by jane eyre fryer your flag and my flag when the story was finished the story people did not applaud they felt sorry for poor philip who had repented so bitterly 
Mary Frances felt sad and sorry too, as she did every time she heard the story, for she had often heard it before. How Americans love their country, said the story king. They must love it as much as we love our island. Indeed they do love it, answered Mary Frances patriotically. I think it is the greatest big country in all the world. The story people smiled and clapped their hands at this speech, for they admire loyalty wherever shown. Yes, it is, said the story queen, and we think our island is the greatest little country in the world. So it is. Indeed it is. I love it next to my own, cried Mary Frances, and the story people applauded again. There is a little poem about the stars and stripes that is very popular in America, said the story lady, smiling. Now that the stories are finished for the day, perhaps our guests will recite it for us. Mary Frances blushed, and then rose in her place and recited, Your flag and my flag, and how it flies today, in your land and my land and half a world away rose red and blood red the stripes forever gleam snow white and soul white the good forefathers dream sky blue and true blue with stars to gleam aright the glory gideon of the day a shelter through the night your flag and my flag and oh how much it holds your land and my land, secure within its folds. Your heart and my heart, beat quicker at the sight. Sun-kissed and wind-tossed, red and blue and white. The one flag, the great flag, the flag for me and you. Glorified all else beside, the red and white and blue. Your flag and my flag. To every star and stripe, the drums beat as hearts beat, and fifers shrilly pipe. Your flag and my flag, a blessing in the sky. Your hope and my hope, it never hid a lie. Homeland and far land and half the world around, O glory hears our glad salute and ripples to the sound. Footnote from the Trail to Boyland by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. Copyright 1904. Used by special permission of the publishers. The Bob's Merrill Company. End footnote. As Mary Frances sat down, the story people clapped their hands enthusiastically, and the ready writer handed her her copies of the stories for the day. The copy of the poem which he had made, he kept for themselves. As Mary Frances and the story lady were going out, the story queen stopped them and said, We shall expect you both to dinner tonight. Just a little family party, you know. Oh, thank you. That will be delightful, both replied. Mary Frances thought ruefully of her best dress hanging uselessly in the closet a home and wished she had it but it's no use wishing she thought it's all so unexpected however with the help of the story lady she was arrayed for the occasion and when she saw herself in the mirror she said there must be two of us that doesn't look like me but it was she. So when they left their apartments and went downstairs into the dining hall, she was in very high spirits. Mary Frances had eaten many dinners, but never one like that. Yet strange to say, she doesn't remember what she ate. But she does remember how kind and friendly the story king and queen were, and how they plied her with questions about her own country. She thinks, perhaps, she begged a little too much in telling of the, its wonders, but she excuses herself 
to herself thinking well my country is worth bragging about i'm sure during a lull in the conversation mary frances asked the king won't you tell me where all the stories come from with pleasure he replied they come from all countries the world is full of people who are doing brave and noble deeds and when we hear of such deeds we have them written down and pass them on of course he added there are other people who are doing cowardly and selfish things but we don't bother with them except to punish them as we did the pirate we see to it that no good story is ever lost that is why we were so concerned about the lost story you can see said the queen that it keeps us pretty busy indeed it must returned mary frances i think it is very kind of you to let me visit you dear child said the queen we shall make a story about it several stories yes delightful stories interrupted the story lady and i shall tell them oh yes i shall tell them End of section 35. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 36 of the Mary Frances Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen the mary frances story book by jane airy fryer the last day on story island the cricket on the hearth a fairy tale of home chirp the first when the story people were all assembled the story lady began to-day we have only one story the cricket on the hearth which was first told by one of our greatest story-tellers charles dickens who wrote the christmas carol and many other stories that children love to hear the peary bingles heyday the cricket's merrier than ever to-night i think said john stopping in his slow way to listen to its musical chirp 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 and it's sure to bring us good fortune john it always has done so to have a cricket on the hearth is the luckiest thing in the world that is what john perry bingle's little wife dot said one stormy night after john had come in from delivering packages and boxes and she had given him his tea and had put the baby to sleep for john perry bingle was a local express man or as they say in england a carrier the first time i heard its cheerful little note john dot continued was the night you brought me home when you brought me to my new home here its little mistress nearly a year ago you recollect john oh yes john remembered i should think so its chirp was such a welcome to me it seemed so full of promise and encouragement it seemed to say you would be kind and gentle with me and would not expect to find an old head on the shoulders of your foolish little wife i had a fear of that john then john thoughtfully patted one of the shoulders and then the head of his little wife as though to say no no he had no such expectation he had been quite content to take them as they were the cricket spoke the truth john for you have been i am sure the most considerate the most affectionate of husbands this has been a happy home john and i love the cricket for its sake why so do i then said the carrier so do i dot i love it for the many times i have heard it dot went on musing and the many thoughts its harmless music has given me sometimes in the twilight when i have felt a little downhearted john before the precious baby came to keep me company and make the house gay when i have thought how lonely you would be if i should die or i should be if you should die its chirp 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 upon the hearth has filled me with new trust and confidence for you see john i was afraid being so much younger than you 
that you might not find me at all suitable as a wife and that you might find it hard to learn to love me as you would if i were older and had had more experience i was thinking just before you came in to-night dear how the cricket has cheered me at such times and i love it for their sake and so do i repeated john but dot how you talk i learn to love you i had learned that long before i brought you here to be the cricket's little mistress dot she laid her hand an instant on his arm and looked up at him as if she would have told him something next moment she was down upon her knees before the basket of packages which john had brought in from his cart perhaps some of them would be called for the others he would deliver in the morning there are not many of them to-night john why what's this round box heart alive john it's a wedding cake leave a woman to find that out said john admiringly now a man would never have thought of it but it's my belief that if you packed a wedding cake in a tea chest or in a feather bed or in a salmon keg a woman would be sure to find it out directly yes i called for it at the pastry cook's and it weighs i don't know what whole hundred weights cried dot making a great show of trying to lift it whose is it john where is it going read the writing on the other side said john why john my goodness john exclaimed dot ah who'd have thought it john returned you never mean to say asked dot sitting on the floor and shaking her head at him that it's for gruff and tackleton the toy maker john nodded mrs peerybingle nodded also fifty times at least in dumb and pitying amazement and tilly slowboy the nursemaid and helper of all work began to talk in an undertone to the baby who had awakened as she walked to and fro with him in her arms was it for gruffs and tackletons then and would it call at the pastry cook's for wedding cakes and did its mothers know the boxes when its fathers brought them home and so on and that marriage is really to come about said dot after seeing the baby after seeing that the baby was all right why she and i were girls at school together john john might have been thinking of how dot looked then but he made no answer and he's as old as on like may why how many years older than you is gruff and tackleton john how many more cups of tea shall i drink at one sitting than gruff and tackleton ever took in four sittings i wonder replied john good-humouredly but even this brought no smile to the face of his little wife the cricket too had stopped somehow the room was not so cheerful as it had been nothing like it the strange old gentleman so these are all the parcels are they john she asked after a little while so these are all the parcels john that's all said john why no i i declare i've clean forgotten the old gentleman the old gentleman in the cart said john he was asleep down in the straw the last time i saw him i've very nearly remembered him twice since i came in but he went out of my head again john hastily rose and lighting a candle went out the door halloa ya hip there rouse up that's my hearty he called as he made his way to the wagon shed soon the stranger stood bareheaded and motionless in the middle of the room he had long white hair good features singularly bold and well defined for an old man his eyes were dark and bright and smiling he saluted the carrier's wife by gravely bowing his clothes were very quaint and old-fashioned a long long way behind the time their colour was brown all over in his hand he carried a great brown club or walking-stick he struck this upon the floor and it fell open and it became a chair on which he sat down quite composedly there said the carrier turning to his wife that's the way i found him sitting by the roadside upright as a millstone and almost as deaf as one sitting in the open air john in the open air replied the carrier just at dusk will you take me along he asked and gave me eighteen pence 
then he got into the cart and here he is he's going john i think not at all he was only going to speak if you please i was to be left till called for said the stranger mildly don't mind me with that he took a pair of spectacles from one of his large pockets and a book from another and leisurely began to read boxer the carrier's big dog came sniffing at his legs but he took no more notice of boxer than if he had been a lamb the carrier and his wife glanced at each other in perplexity the stranger raised his head and looking from dot toward john said your daughter my good friend wife said john niece asked the stranger wife roared john indeed observed the stranger surely very young dot took the baby from the couch where tilly slowboy had laid him the stranger quietly resumed his reading but before he had read two lines he interrupted his reading to say to john baby yours john gave a gigantic nod equal to an answer given through a speaking trumpet girl asked the stranger boy roared john also very young heh mrs peerybingle instantly spoke two months and three days vaccinated just six weeks ago took very finely considered by the doctors a remarkable beautiful child equal to the general run of children at five months old takes notice of everything may seem impossible to you but true here the breathless little mother who had been shrieking these short sentences into the old man's ear until her face was crimson held the baby up before him to prove her words while tilly slowboy sprang around in cow-like gambols to amuse the infant uttering words which sounded like catcher catcher hark said john he's called for sure enough there's someone at the door open it tilly caleb plummer before she could reach it however it was open from the outside for it was a primitive sort of door with a latch that any one could lift if he chose in came a little meagre thoughtful dingy-faced man he seemed to have made himself a great coat from the burlap covering of some old box for when he turned to shut the door and keep the weather out one could read upon the back of the garment the letters g and t in large black capitals also the word glass in smaller capitals good evening john said the little man good evening mum good evening tilly good evening unbeknown how's baby mum boxer's pretty well i hope all well and thriving caleb replied dot i am sure you need only to look at the dear child for one to know that and i'm sure i only need to look at you for another said caleb or at john for another or tilly as far as that goes or certainly at boxer busy just now caleb asked the carrier why pretty busy john he returned pretty much so there's a lot of demand for noah's arks at present i'd like to be able to take more pains in making the families but i can't do it at the price it would be a satisfaction though to one's mind to make it plain which was shems and hams and which was wives ah well have you got anything in the parcel line for me john the carrier put his hand into the pocket of the coat he had taken off and brought out a tiny flower pot carefully wrapped in moss and tissue paper there it is he said adjusting it with great care not so much as a leaf damaged full of buds caleb's dull eye brightened as he took it and thanked him it was expensive caleb said the carrier very dear at this season never mind that it would be cheap to me whatever it cost returned the little man anything else john a small box replied the carrier here you are for caleb plummer read the old man spelling out the directions with cash john i don't think it's for me with care corrected the carrier looking over his shoulder where do you make out cash oh to be sure said caleb it's all right with care yes yes that's mine it might have been with cash if my dear boy in south america had lived john you loved him like a son didn't you you needn't say you did i know of course he read again caleb plummer with care yes yes it's all right it's a box of dolls eyes for my daughter's work 
i wish it was her own sight in a box john i wish it was or could be cried the carrier thank ye said the little man you speak very hearty to think that she should never see the dolls and them a-staring at her so bold all day long that's where it cuts what's the cost john what's the damage i'll damage you said john if you ask well it's like you to say that observed the little man it's your kind way let me see i think that's all i think not said the carrier try again something for our governor eh asked caleb after thinking a little while to be sure that's what i came for but my head's so full of them noah's arks and things he hasn't been here has he not he returned the carrier he's too busy courting he's coming though said caleb for he told me to keep on the near side of the road going home and it was ten to one he'd take me up i'd better go by the way he turned to dot you couldn't have the goodness to let me pinch boxer's tail mum for half a moment could you why caleb what a question oh never mind mum said the little man he mightn't like it perhaps there's a small order come in for toys dogs that will bark and i wish to go as close to nature as possible for a sixpence that's all never mind mum it happened that boxer just at that moment began to bark with zeal but as this bark meant the approach of some new visitor caleb postponing his study of dogs barks shouldered the big round box of wedding cake and said good-bye he might have spared himself the trouble however for he met his employer upon the threshold tackleton oh you are here are you wait a bit i'll take you home he turned to john john peerybingle my service to you more of my service to your pretty wife handsomer every day and younger i should be astonished at your paying compliments mr tackleton said dot not altogether pleasantly but for what i have just heard about you being engaged to be married you know all about it then i have gotten myself to believe it somehow said dot after a hard struggle i suppose very tackleton the toy merchant was well known in the neighbourhood many people called him gruff and tackleton the name of the firm when gruff was tackleton's partner although tackleton had bought out gruff's interest years before the name still remained it was odd that such a man should have been a toy-maker for he had no interest in toys whatever he despised them and wouldn't have bought one for the world the only toys in his shop which he could abide were the ugly ones hideous red-eyed jacks in boxes vampire kites and fiery dragons really did give him some pleasure for he saw that they scared little children a very pleasant person tackleton not the kind of person you would think was going to be married and to a young wife too a beautiful young wife he didn't look much like a bridegroom as he stood in the carrier's kitchen with a twist in his dry face and a screw in his body and his hat jerked over the bridge of his nose and his hands tucked down into the bottom of his pockets and his whole sarcastic ill-conditioned self peering out of one little corner of one little eye like the concentrated essence of any number of ravens but a bridegroom he was designed to be in three days time next thursday the last day of the first month of the year is my wedding day said tackleton did i mention that he had always one eye wide open and one eye nearly shut and the eye nearly shut was always the expressive eye i don't think i did that's my wedding day said tackleton rattling his money in his pocket why that's the anniversary of our wedding too exclaimed the carrier ha ha laughed tackleton odd you're just another couple as we will be just at this speech dot was most indignant what next would the man say as though her john resembled tackleton in any particular i say a word with you murmured tackleton nudging the carrier with his elbow and taking him off a little way you'll come to the wedding won't you we're in the same boat you know how in the same boat asked john why you're not so youthful as your wife yourself said tackleton with another nudge come and spend an evening with us beforehand why 
demanded john astonished at this hospitality why returned the other that's a new way to receive an invitation why for pleasure to be sociable you know and all that i thought you were never sociable said john in his plain way as you like what does it matter your company will produce a favorable impression on mrs tackleton that will be you'll say you'll come we have arranged to keep our wedding day at home said john we think you see that home bah what's home cried tackleton four walls and a ceiling why don't you kill that cricket i would i always do i hate their noise you'll say you'll come to-morrow evening you kill the crickets heh said john scrunch em sir returned the other setting his heel heavily on the floor then you won't give us to-morrow evening well next day you go out visiting i know i'll meet you there and bring my wife that is to be it'll do her good you're agreeable thank ye what's that dot is upset it was a loud cry from the carrier's wife a loud sharp sudden cry that made the room ring like a glass bell that was struck she had risen from her seat and stood like one transfixed by terror and surprise the stranger had gone toward the fire to warm himself but he was quite still dot cried the carrier darling dot what's the matter they were all about her in a moment caleb who had been dozing on the cake box in the first start seized tilly slowboy by the hair but immediately apologized mary exclaimed the carrier for dot's real name was mary dot being only a pet name of her husband's mary dear are you ill what is it tell me dear but at first she could not answer she wept bitterly and covered her face with her apron then burst into a wild fit of laughter and then started crying again at length she let john lead her to the fire where she sat down the old man was standing there as before i'm better john she said i'm quite well it was only a fancy something coming before my eyes it's gone quite gone now but why did she look at the old gentleman as if addressing him thought john was her mind wondering i'm glad it's gone muttered tackleton turning the expressive eye around the room i wonder where it's gone and what it was humph caleb come here who's that man with the gray hair i don't know sir caleb answered in a whisper never saw him before in all my life he'd make a beautiful figure for a nutcracker quite a new model not ugly enough said tackleton or a match safe caleb continued what a model unscrew his head to put the matches in let them fall down to his neck and take out not half ugly enough said tackleton nothing in him at all come bring that box all right now i hope mrs peerybingle oh quite right quite right said the little woman waving him hurriedly away good night good night said tackleton good night john peerybingle take care how you carry that box caleb let it fall and i'll murder you dark as pitch and weather worse than ever heh good night so with another sharp look round the room he went out the door followed by caleb with the wedding cake on his head the carrier had been so much astonished by his little wife and so busily trying to soothe her that he had scarcely been conscious of the stranger's presence until now when he looked up and saw him standing there their only guest he didn't belong to them you see said john i must give him a hint to go just at that moment the old gentleman came toward him saying i beg your pardon friend but since my attendant has not come and the weather is so bad can you in your kindness let me rent a bed here yes yes cried dot yes certainly oh exclaimed the carrier surprised by the quickness of her consent well i don't object still i'm not quite sure hush she interrupted dear john please why he's stone deaf urged john i know but she turned to the stranger yes sir certainly yes certainly then to john i'll make him up a bed directly john as she hurried off to do it 
the fluttering way she did it was so strange that the carrier looked after her quite dumbfounded did its mothers make up a beds then cried tilly slow boy to the baby and did its hair grow brown and curly when its caps was lifted off and frightened it as precious pets a sitting by the fire what frightened dot i wonder thought the carrier pacing to and fro and half listening to tilly's silly chatter the bed was soon made ready and the stranger who would not take anything but a cup of tea retired after dot put the baby to bed she arranged the great comfortable fireside chair for the carrier and filled his pipe for him then she brought her little stool and placing it beside his knee sat down for a cosy chat but the carrier fell to dreaming and boxer who was stretched at his feet i am quite ashamed to say snored aloud just then the cricket began its song and dot too fell a-dreaming but what was that young figure of a man which remained there singly and alone why did it linger still so near her with its arm upon the chimney-piece ever repeating in a whisper married and not to me end of section thirty six section number thirty seven of the mary frances story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the mary frances story book by jane eyre fryer chip the second bertha the blind girl and her father caleb plummer the toy maker and his blind daughter lived all alone by themselves as the story books say in a little cracked nutshell of a wooden house close to the big establishment of gruff and tackleton the toy merchants i have said that caleb and his poor blind daughter lived here i should have said that caleb lived here and his poor blind daughter lived somewhere else in a sort of enchanted fairyland where no shabbiness or poverty or trouble ever entered for caleb in the magic of his devoted deathless love for his daughter played a little game of pretend which made the blind girl think their home beautiful her father rich and handsome and that nothing was lacking which they needed the blind girl never knew that the ceilings were broken and the walls blotched and bare of plaster here and there the beams warped and bending because of age the blind girl never knew that the woodwork was rotting and the paper peeling off the walls and the little building withering away the blind girl never knew that the dishes were ugly and cracked and the carpets threadbare that sorrow and faint-heartedness were in the house that caleb's scanty hairs were turning grayer and more gray before her sightless face the blind girl never knew that they had a master cold exacting and not caring how they got along never knew that tackleton was tackleton in fact for caleb led her to think his rough words were meant for jokes that he was very good to them and had a peculiarity in that he could not bear to be thanked for any favor he had done you know why he did this it was because he felt so sorry for poor blind bertha that he deceived her into thinking everything lovely and fair in order that she might be happier he too had a cricket singing on the hearth when his motherless girl was very young and when he listened to its music he made up his mind to cheer the little one's dark way by every means he could devise caleb and his daughter were at work together in their usual working room which served them for their ordinary living room as well and a strange place it was there were houses in it furnished and unfurnished for dolls of all stations in life nice houses for dolls of moderate means 
smaller houses for dolls not so well off fine town residences for dolls of high estate some of the houses were already furnished with a view to the conveniences of dolls of limited income others could be furnished on notice from the shelves nearby which were full of chairs and tables sofas bedsteads and other articles of furniture then there were many dolls themselves of all kinds and from all stations of life there were various other samples of his handicraft besides dolls and dolls houses in caleb Plummer's room there were noah's arks in which the birds and beasts were uncommonly tight fit i assure you there were scores of little carts which when the wheels went round performed most doleful music there were small fiddles and drums and no end of cannon shields and spears there were little fellows in red breeches who would tumble down head first along a piece of tape there were old gentlemen dolls who would fly over trapeze bars when pressed in the right place there were beasts of all sorts horses in particular of every breed from the little spotted gray on four legs to the thoroughbred rocked on his highest mettle there were dozens and dozens of other little toys but you already can imagine how the room looked in the midst of all these objects caleb and his daughter sat at work the blind girl busy as a doll's dressmaker caleb painting a desirable doll's family mansion so you were out in the rain last night father in your beautiful new gray coat said caleb's daughter in my beautiful new gray coat answered caleb glancing towards a clothes rack in the room on which the burlap garment was carefully hung to dry how glad i am you bought it father and such a stylish tailor it is too good for me said caleb the blind girl resting from her work and laughed with delight too good father what can be too good for you i'm half ashamed to wear it though said caleb watching the effect of what he said on her brightening face upon my word when i hear the boys and people say behind me hello here's a swell i don't know which way to look and when the beggar wouldn't go away last night and when i said i am a very common man said no your honor bless your honor don't say that i was quite ashamed i really felt as if i hadn't a right to wear it happy blind girl how merry she was with that idea i see you father she said clapping her hands as plainly as if i had the eyes i never want when you are with me a blue coat bright blue said caleb yes yes bright blue exclaimed the girl turning up her radiant face the color i can just remember in the blessed sky you told me it was blue before a bright blue coat made loose to the figure suggested caleb yes loose to the figure cried the blind girl laughing heartily and in it you dear father with your merry eye you smiling face your free step and your dark hair looking so young and handsome there there said caleb i shall be vain presently i think you are already cried the blind girl pointing at him in her glee i know you father ha 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 i found you out you see how different the picture in her mind from caleb as he sat observing her she had spoken of his free step she was right in that for years and years he had never once crossed their threshold with his own slow pace but with a football free and sprightly for her to hear and never even when his heart was heaviest had he forgotten the light tread that was to render her own so cheerful and courageous there we are said caleb falling back a step or two to better judge his work it's a pity the whole front of this doll's house opens at once if there was only a staircase in it now and regular doors to go in at but 
that's the worst of my work i'm always trying to make believe you are speaking quite softly are you tired father tired echoed caleb with a great burst of enthusiasm what should tire me bertha i was never tired what does it mean to give greater force to his words he checked himself in the middle of a yawn and began to hum a song he sang it with a pretended carefree manner that made his face look a thousand times more meagre and more thoughtful than before tackleton comes in just then tackleton put his head in at the door what you're singing are you he thundered go it i can't sing nobody would have suspected that he could he hadn't a singing face by any means i can't afford to sing said tackleton i'm glad you can i hope you can afford to work too hardly time for both i should think caleb turned toward his daughter and said in a low tone if you could only see him bertha how he's winking at me such a man to joke you think if you didn't know him he was in earnest wouldn't you now the blind girl smiled and nodded the bird that can sing and won't sing must be made to sing grumbled tackleton what about the owl that can't sing and oughtn't to sing and will sing is there anything that he should be made to do the way he's winking at me this moment whispered caleb to his daughter oh my gracious always merry and light-hearted with us cried the smiling bertha oh you're there aren't you answered tackleton poor idiot he really did believe she was an idiot and strange to say he thought her an idiot because she was fond of him well being there how are you said tackleton in his grudging way oh well quite well and as happy as even you could wish me to be as happy as you would make the whole world if you could poor idiot muttered tackleton no gleam of reason not a gleam the blind girl took his hand and held it a moment in her own two hands and laid her cheek against it tenderly before releasing it there was so much affectionate gratitude in the act that tackleton himself was moved to say in a milder growl than usual what's the matter now i stood the little plant beside my pillow when i went to sleep last night and remembered it in my dreams when the day came and the glorious red sun the red sun father red in the mornings and in the evenings bertha said poor caleb with a woeful glance at his employer when it rose and bright light came into the room i turned the little tree towards it and blessed heaven for making such precious things and bless you for sending it to cheer me whoo said tackleton under his breath we're getting on the next thing will be the padded cell meanwhile caleb looked as if he were uncertain whether tackleton had done anything deserving of praise or not yet he knew that with his own hands he had brought the little rose tree home for her so carefully and that with his own lips he made her believe that it was a gift from tackleton in order to keep her from suspecting how much he every day denied himself to save the money it cost that she might be happier bertha said tackleton with for once a show of cordiality come here oh i can come straight to you you needn't guide me shall i tell you a secret bertha if you will she answered eagerly how bright the darkened face looked how anxious the listening head this is the day on which that spoiled child john pure bingle's wife pays her regular visit to you makes what she calls her picnic here ain't it said tackleton with a look of distaste for the affair yes replied bertha this is the day i thought so said tackleton i should like to join the party do you hear that father 
cried Bertha in delight. Yes, yes, I heard, murmured Caleb, with the look somewhat of a sleepwalker. But I don't believe it. You see, said Tackleton, I, I want to bring the Perry Bingles a little more into the company of May Fielding, for I am going to be married to May. Married, cried the blind girl, starting from him. Oh, she's such a confounded idiot, muttered Tackleton, that I was afraid she never comprehend. Ah, yes, Bertha, married. Church, parson, clerk, bells, satin, veils, and all the rest of the tomfoolery. A wedding, you know, a wedding. Don't you know what a wedding is? I know, replied the blind girl gently. I understand. Do you? muttered Tackleton. It's more than I expected. Then aloud, well, on that account, I want to join the party and bring May and her mother. I'll send in a little something or other before the afternoon, a cold leg of mutton or some comfortable trifle of that sort. You'll expect me? Yes, she answered, turning away. I don't think you will, muttered Tackleton, looking at her, for you seem to have forgotten all about it already, Caleb. I may venture to say I'm here, I suppose, thought Caleb. Sir, take care she don't forget what I've been saying to her. She never forgets, returned Caleb. It is one of the few things she ain't clever in. Every man thinks his geese swans, observed the toy merchant, with a shrug of his shoulders, poor idiot. Having delivered this remark with much contempt, Old Gruff and Tackleton went out. Bertha's Eyes Bertha remained where he had left her, lost in thought. The gaiety had vanished from her face, and it was very sad. Three or four times she shook her head as if bewailing some loss. It was not until Caleb had been busy for some time in yoking a team of wooden horses to the tongue of a little wooden wagon by the simple means of nails driven through the vital parts of their bodies that she drew near his workbench and sitting down beside him said father i am lonely i want to borrow your eyes here they are said caleb always ready they are more yours than mine bertha any hour in the four and twenty what shall your eyes do for you, dear? My patient, willing eyes, the blind girl said. Will they look around the room, father? All right. No sooner than that done, Bertha. Tell me about it. It's much the same as usual, said Caleb. Homely but snug. The gay colors on the walls, the bright flowers on the plates, and other dishes. The shining wood where there are no panels, the general cheerfulness and neatness of the building, all make it very pretty. Cheerful and neat it was, wherever Bertha's hands could busy themselves, but nowhere else were cheerfulness and neatness possible in the old crazy shed which Caleb's fancy painted with such pleasant description. You have your working clothes on, and are not so gallant as when you wear the handsome coat, said Bertha, touching him. Not quite so gallant, answered Caleb. Pretty lively, though. Father, said the blind girl, drawing close to his side and putting one arm around his neck, tell me something about May. Is she very pretty? She is indeed, said Caleb, and she was indeed. It was quite a rare thing for Caleb not to draw upon his imagination. I can't imagine her, said Bertha. Her hair is dark, darker than mine. Her voice is sweet and musical. I know. I have often loved to hear it. Her form. There is not a doll in the room can compare with her, said Caleb. And her eyes. He stopped for Bertha's arm around his neck had given a sudden pressure. He coughed a moment, hammered a moment, 
then began to sing the gay song about the sparkling bowl a thing he always did when in such difficulties now about your friend our benefactor mr tackleton i am never tired you know of hearing about him now was i ever she said hastily of course not answered caleb and with reason ah with much reason cried the blind girl so fervently that caleb began to doubt if he had been wise in deceiving her tell me about him dear father said bertha many times again his face is kind and tender honest and true i am sure it is the goodness in his heart shines out in his countenance and makes it noble added caleb who was rather desperate by now and makes it noble cried the blind girl he is older than may father yes quite a little older but that don't signify said caleb oh no father just to think she can do so much for him when he grows old and infirm and can nurse him if he gets ill and help him in every way will she do all this father no doubt of it said caleb i love her for that father i love her with all my heart exclaimed the blind girl the carrier's cart in the meantime there had been a lively scene at john peerinbill's for little mrs peerinbill naturally couldn't think of going anywhere without the baby and to get the baby ready took time not that there was so much of the baby but there was so much to do about it and it all had to be done by easy stages for instance when the baby was got by hook or by crook to a certain point in dressing and you might have supposed that another touch or two would finish him off and turn him out a tip-top baby he was unexpectedly extinguished in a warm nightgown and hustled off to bed where he simmered so to speak between sheets and blankets for the best part of an hour from this place of inaction he was recalled shining very much and roaring violently to partake of his luncheon after which he went to sleep again then mrs perrybingle took the opportunity to make herself look as fine as possible and miss slowboy put on her best bib and tucker by this time the baby being all alive again was dressed by the united efforts of mrs perrybingle and miss slowboy and put into his cream-colored coat and flannel cap and so in course of time they all three got to the door when john's old horse stood tearing up the road with impatient autographs and from what boxer might be seen a little distance down the road looking back tempting the horse to come on without orders if you think that mrs perrybingle needed a chair or anything of that kind to help her climb into the cart you are mistaken or you don't know john perrybingle for before you could have seen him he lifted her from the ground and there she was in place fresh and rosy saying oh john how can you already asked john starting off after miss slowboy and the baby were in place john you've got the basket with the veal and ham pie and other things asked dot if you haven't you must turn around again this very minute you're a nice little article replied the carrier to be talking about turning round after keeping me a full quarter of an hour i am sorry for it john said dot but i really could not think of going to bertha's i would not do it john on any account without the veal and ham pie and things whoa the last word was addressed to the horse who didn't mind at all oh do turn around john begged mrs perrybingle please it'll be time enough to do that said john when i begin to leave things behind the basket's here safe enough 
what a hard-hearted monster you must be john not to have said so at once and save me such a turn i declare i wouldn't go to bertha's without the veal and ham pie and things for any money regularly once a fortnight ever since we have been married we have had our little picnic if anything were to go wrong with it i should almost think we were never to be lucky again it was a kind thought in the first place said the carrier and i honor you for it little woman my dear john replied dot turning very red don't talk about honoring me good gracious by the by observed the carrier that old gentleman dot look embarrassed he is an odd fish said the carrier can't make him out i don't believe there's any harm in him though none at all i'm i'm sure there's none at all yes said the carrier with his eyes attracted to her face because she had spoken so earnestly well i am glad you feel so certain about it because it makes me feel sure it's curious he should have taken it into his head to ask us for lodgings ain't it things come about so strangely so very strangely she rejoined in a low voice scarcely audible however he's a good-natured old gentleman said john and pays as a gentleman and i think his word is to be relied upon like a gentleman's i had quite a long talk with him this morning he can hear me better already he says as he gets more used to my voice he told me a great deal about himself and i told him a good deal about myself and a rare lot of questions he asked me i told him about having two roots you know in my business one day going to the right from our house and back again another day going left from our house and back again for he's a stranger and don't know the names of the places about here and he seemed quite pleased why he says then i shall be returning your way to-night i thought i'd be coming in exactly the opposite direction that's capital i may trouble you for another lift perhaps but i'll promise not to fall asleep again he was sound asleep surely dot what are you thinking of thinking of john i i was listening to you oh that's all right said the carrier i was afraid from the look of your face that i had gone rambling on so long as to set you thinking of something else i was very near it i'll be bound dot making no reply they jogged on for some time in silence but it was not very easy to remain silent long in john perrybingle's cart for everybody on the road has something to say though it might only be how are you and indeed it was very often nothing else sometimes passengers on foot or on horseback plodded on a little way beside the cart just for the pleasure of having a chat then too everybody knew boxer all along the road especially the fowls and pigs who when they saw him coming running with his body all on one side and his ears pricked up inquisitively would make tracks and not wait for any nearer acquaintance whenever he went somebody or another might cry hello here's boxer and with that out came at least two or three other somebodies to bid john perrybingle and his pretty wife good day the packages and parcels to be delivered were as numerous as usual and it required many stops to give them out this was not the worst part of the journey by any means some people were so full of wonder about their parcels and other people so full of directions about the parcels they were sending off by john and john took so keen an interest in all the parcels that it was as good as a play 
and Dot thoroughly enjoyed it as she looked on from her seat in the cart. The trip was a little foggy, to be sure, in the January weather, and was raw and cold, but who cared for such trifles? Not Dot, decidedly. Not Tilly Slowboy, for she deemed sitting in the cart on any terms the highest point of human joys. Not the baby, I'll be bound, for it's not in baby nature to be warmer or more sound asleep than the blessed young Perry Bingle was all the way. You couldn't see very far in the fog, of course, but you could see a great deal. It's astonishing how much you may see in a thicker fog than that, if you will only take the trouble to look for it. Why, even to sit looking for hazy fairy rings and ghostly figures near the hedges and trees was a pleasant occupation. To make no mention of the unexpected shapes in which the trees themselves came out of the mist and glided in again. In one place there was a great mound of weeds burning, and they watched the fire flaring through the fog, with here and there a dash of red in it, until, because of getting smoke up her nose, as she explained, Miss Slowboy choked and woke the baby, who wouldn't go to sleep again. But Boxer, who was in advance a quarter of a mile or so, had passed the outskirts of the town and gained the corner of the street where Caleb and his daughter lived, and long before they reached the door, he and the blind girl were on the pavement waiting to receive them. The Party at Caleb's May Fielding was already there, and so was her mother, a little querulous chip of an old lady with a peevish face. Gruff and Tackleton was also there, pretending to be agreeable and perfectly at home, and really quite as much out of his element as a fish out of water. May, my dear old friend, cried Dot, running up to meet her. What happiness to see you! Her old friend was as glad as she, and it really was. If you believe me, a pleasant sight to see them embrace each other. Tackleton had shown taste, beyond all question. May was very pretty, and so was Dot pretty. They simply set each other's beauty off, and, as John Perry Bingle came near saying, they ought to have been born sisters, which was the only improvement you could have suggested. Tackleton had brought his leg of mutton, and, wonderful to relate, a tart beside. But he could afford such generosity this time. One didn't get married every day. And in addition to those dainties, there were the veal and ham pie and things, as Mrs. Perry Bingle called them, which were chiefly nuts and oranges and cakes. When the repast was set forth on the table, together with Caleb's contribution, a bowl of smoking potatoes, which was all he was allowed to provide, Tackleton led his future mother-in-law to the post of honor. Why, she was gotten up for the occasion, even wearing gloves. Caleb sat next to his daughter. Dot and her old school friend were side by side. The carrier took care of the bottom of the table. Mrs. Slowboy was seated a little distance away, far from every other article of furniture but the chair she sat on, that she might have nothing to knock the baby's head against. She was delighted not only to take care of the baby, but to stare around at the toys. "'Ah, May,' said Dot, "'dear, dear, what changes! To talk these merry school days makes one young again. "'Why, you ain't particularly old at any time, are you?' said Tackleton. Look at my sober, plodding husband there, returned Dot. He adds twenty years to my age at least. Don't you, John? Forty, John replied. How many you'll add to May's, I am sure I don't know, said Dot, laughing. 
but she can't be much less than a hundred years of age on her next birthday ha ha laughed tackleton hollow as a drum was the laugh though and he looked as if he could have twisted dot's neck comfortably dear dear said dot only think how we used to talk sometimes about the husbands we would choose i don't know how lively and gay mine was not to be and as to may's oh dear i don't know whether to laugh or cry when i think what silly girls we were may seemed to know which to do for the color flashed into her face and tears stood in her eyes we little thought how things would come about said dot i never fixed on john i am sure i never so much as thought of him and if i had told you you were ever to be married to mr tackleton why you'd have slapped me wouldn't you may though may didn't say yes she certainly didn't say no or express no by any means tackleton laughed quite shouted he laughed so loud john perrybingle laughed too in his ordinary good-natured and contented manner but his was a mere whisper of a laugh compared to tackleton's you couldn't help yourselves for all that said tackleton you couldn't resist us you see here we are here we are where are your gay young bridegrooms now some of them are dead said dot and some of them forgotten some of them if they could stand among us at this moment would not believe that we are the same creatures because they would not believe we could forget them no they would not believe one word of it why dot exclaimed the carrier little woman and dot kept quiet while tackleton looked at her through his half-shut eye may uttered no word good or bad but sat quite still with her eyes downcast and made no sign of interest in what had passed her mother however observed that girls were girls and bygones were bygones and that so long as young people were young and thoughtless they would probably conduct themselves like young and thoughtless persons she then remarked that she thanked heaven that she had always found in may a dutiful and obedient child for which she took no credit to herself though she had every reason to believe it was owing to herself with regard to mr tackleton she said that he was a son-in-law to be desired as no one in their senses could doubt now the meal ended john perrybingle rose to go for he only stopped to feed his horse and to enjoy the social hour before finishing his route he would call for dot on his way back this was always the program on picnic days good-bye he said pulling on his dreadnought coat i shall be back at the usual time good-bye all then he called boxer and soon the old horse and the cart were making lively music down the road caleb and bertha were talking together at one end of the room so bring me the precious baby tilly said dot drawing a chair to the fire and while i have him in my lap here's mrs fielding tilly who will tell me all about the management of babies and straighten me out in twenty points where i am as wrong as can be won't you mrs fielding here tackleton walked out and mrs fielding sitting bolt upright in front of dot gave her such a marvellous collection of receipts and rules that would if dot had carried them out have utterly destroyed the young perry bingle even if he had been an infant samson now dot brought her needlework out of her pocket and had a whispering chat with may while the old lady dozed and after a while caleb and bertha joined them and all found it a very short afternoon then as it grew dark since it was the solemn rule that bertha should do no housework tasks 
on the days of the picnics dot trimmed the fire and swept the hearth and set the tea tray out and drew the curtains and lighted a candle then she played an air or two on a rude kind of harp which caleb had made for bertha and played them very well for nature had made her delicate little ear as choice as one for music as it would have been for jewels if she had had them to wear by this time it was the usual hour for tea and tackleton came back again to share the meal and spend the evening when it was night and tea was over and dot had nothing more to do after washing the cups and saucers when the time drew near for the carrier's return dot began to grow nervous every time she heard the sound of distant wheels her color came and went and she was restless not as good wives are when listening for their husbands no no it was a different sort of restlessness from that soon wheels were heard very near horses feet the barking of a dog and then the scratching of boxer's paw whose step is that cried bertha starting up whose step said the carrier standing in the door his brown face ruddy as a winter's berry from the keen night air why mine the other step bertha said the man's tread behind you she's not to be deceived observed the carrier laughing come on sir you'll be welcome never fear the shadow on the hearth he spoke in a loud tone and as he spoke the deaf old gentleman entered he's not so much a stranger that you haven't seen him once caleb said the carrier you'll give him house room till we go oh surely john and take it as an honor he's the best company on earth to talk secrets in said john i have reasonably good lungs but he tried them i'll tell you turning to the old gentleman he spoke in a loud voice again sit down sir all friends here and glad to see you then he added in his natural tone a chair in the chimney corner and leave to sit silent and look pleasantly about him is all he cares for he's easily pleased bertha had been listening intently she called caleb to her side and when he came asked him in a low voice to describe their visitor when he had done so she moved away and showed no further interest in him the carrier was in high spirits good fellow that he was and fonder of his little wife than ever some folks may think it queer he said jokingly putting his rough arm about her as she stood apart from the others but i like the little lady somehow look yonder dot he pointed to the old man she looked down i think she trembled he's ha 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 he is so fond of you that he talked of nothing else the whole way here i like him for it i wish he had a better subject john she said with an uneasy glance about the room at tackleton especially a better subject cried the jovial john there's no such thing come off with the great coat off with this thick shawl off with the heavy wrappings and now for a cosy half hour by the fire how would it please you mrs fielding to have a game of cards you and i all right where are the cards dot and will you let us have a cup of tea here if there's any left small wife soon the carrier and the old lady were deep within the game at first the carrier looked about him sometimes with a smile or now and then called dot to peep over his shoulder to advise him on some naughty point but soon he became so absorbed that he had neither eyes nor ears to spare and his whole attention was upon the cards he thought of nothing else until a hand was laid upon his shoulder i am sorry to disturb you said tackleton in a low voice but i want a word with you please 
it's my turn to deal returned the carrier can you wait no said tackleton come on man there was an expression in his pale face which made john rise immediately and ask him in a hurry what the matter was hush john Perrybingle," said tackleton i am sorry for this i am indeed i have been afraid of it i have suspected it from the first what is it asked the carrier in alarm hush i'll show you if you come with me the carrier accompanied him without another word they went across the yard where the stars were shining and by a little side door they entered tackleton's own counting house there through a window they could look into a window of the ware room where the boxes of toys were kept the counting house was closed for the night and there was no light but a dim light was burning in the ware room so they could easily see within wait a moment said tackleton can you bear to look through that window do you think why not asked the carrier it will be a shock said tackleton promise not to do anything violent and then john looked and what do you think he saw he saw his dear young wife with the old man old no longer but straight and handsome holding in his hands his soft white hair with which he had made every one think him old and treat him so kindly he saw her listening to him as he bent his head to whisper in her ear and then let him place his arm about her waist and lead her slowly to the door he saw her with her own hands adjust the wig on his head laughing as she did so john felt weak as an infant as tackleton led him back to the house he was wrapped up to the chin and busy with his horse and parcels when she came into the room ready for going home now john dear good night may good night bertha she said how could she kiss them how be so blithe and gay in her parting why didn't she blush tackleton as well as john wondered tilly was hushing the baby and as she walked to and fro she was repeating drowsily did they thought that it was to be its wives wring its heart almost to breaking and did it weep all nights when nobody was there to see it now tilly give me the baby said little mrs peary bingle good night mr tackleton where's john for goodness sake he's going to walk beside the horse's head said tackleton who helped her into the cart my dear john walk to-night the muffled figure of her husband made a hasty sign and the stranger and nurse being by this time in their places the old horse moved off boxer running on before running back running round and round the cart and barking merrily when tackleton had gone off likewise taking may and her mother poor caleb sat down by the fire beside his daughter the toys that had been wound and set in motion for the baby had run down long ago in the silence one might have imagined that they had been stricken motionless with wonder at dot being false or tackleton beloved under any set of circumstances presently bertha spoke after mr tackleton is married we shall not see so much of him shall we father well we might that is to say began caleb how i should love to be like may father and have my eyes so that i might serve him might show my love for him who has been so good so kind so dear poor caleb how often he said to himself as he looked at her in remorse have i deceived her from her cradle thinking to make her happier but to break her heart at last end of section thirty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c